Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Prashant Kochavara. I'm the director of product uh, for a Kubernetes offering at Trilio. And uh, today we are going to be talking about quantifying the business value of cloud-native data management. So we've all been hearing about uh, you know, data on Kubernetes, you know, bringing your stateful workloads. Uh, so today's session is going to talk about or go through why you need to invest in a cloud-native data management solution and the benefits of doing so. So from an agenda perspective, uh, I'm going to talk about the market. What are we seeing in terms of traction, in terms of customer adoption, and you know how it's moving into more of a data-oriented world on Kubernetes. Uh, after that, we'll do a quick case study. We'll introduce you to a pseudo uh, organization that we've created, Acme Corp. We'll go through an overview of who Acme Corp is, how are they running their operations, and we'll use that a pseudo organization to quantify some benefits that they're going to see uh, adopting a cloud native data management solution. And then finally, we'll go through the cost benefit analysis, uh, you know, going through each and every use case uh, one by one, putting some numbers together, and uh, eventually finding out what are the benefits that we are going to get from a cloud native data management solution. So there are multiple challenges that IT ops and DevOps face today. Right. Infrastructure resiliency, migration, governance compliance, service level agreements, self-service, and most importantly, security around ransomware and similar issues. Right. So these are real problems that everyone's facing, whether whichever part of the application lifecycle development you may be in, these are all real challenges that you know, people have been complaining about. Now, let's talk about the Kubernetes market adoption and growth. Right. Now, Kubernetes began like any new uh, technology infrastructure, any new technology paradigm with uh, a lot of stateless applications. Right? The reason for that being is that whenever you have a new technology, people are not going to put all their investments into it right away. They're going to go step by step. They'll start off with stateless workloads. They will start connecting those stateless workloads to uh, databases outside. Uh, after which they'll start bringing in more stateful applications, basic ones, and then they will, uh, you know, bring in their more mission critical applications. If you think about, you know, uh, look at the past from a virtualization perspective, uh, that was the trajectory that customers have followed. If you think about public cloud, same kind of trajectory, and you know, if you think about other kind of infrastructures like hyperconverged. Uh, they also have followed the same model where you kind of test it out first and then you bring in your mission critical apps. And that is what we are seeing with Kubernetes now. Your stateful workloads are coming in uh, because you want to have that innovation done faster. You want simplified management, right? If you have your application spread across different silos, management overhead becomes very, very uh, painful, right? And then, obviously, from a better TCO perspective, having a single architecture on Kubernetes where your you know, application metadata, data, everything lives together is just going to be beneficial uh, all throughout. Now, the graphic that I have on the right is from a 2020 CNCF survey. Um, we don't have the 2021 results out yet, but 55% were already using uh, storage in production. So now you can just speculate where it would be you know, after a year and a half and what people are doing. And especially if you look at uh, you know, all these sessions that we have, have we've been having at KubeCon, the expo floor, everything talks about data. Or a lot of uh, vendors are bringing their, uh, you know, bringing their tools into Kubernetes to manage and play around with that data. Now let's go through uh, the pseudo organization that we have defined, uh, Acme. Now, Acme is a, uh, you know, is a organization that deals with uh, social media outlook, uh, uses a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning for data intelligence. Uh, they have about $500 uh, million of revenue a year. Uh, reputation is very important for this uh, organization, so it's a pillar company within its industry. Uh, today, they're releasing uh, once a week, but they do want to improve that. Uh, they have a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud approach. They want to go, uh, you know, full-blown Kubernetes with a cloud-native first approach. And from a data perspective, which is what we're going to be using for our quants, we will assume there are 100 apps. Uh, each app is about 100 GB. And there are about uh, 100 captures happening a day, you know, in terms of uh, 
uh, backup and point in time recovery. And then we'll also assume that there is a 10% change rate in terms of the data that is generated. Now, what are the goals of this organization? Security is number one, right? No matter what you do, wherever you put your data or your infrastructure, you want to make sure that it's very secure. They want to ensure that there is more self-service to empower the development teams. They want to release more often, right? When you release more often, you're going to, it's going to have a direct impact on your revenue, right? So they want to release at least two more times or two or more times a day. At the same time, you know, having multiple infrastructures, they want to reduce their cloud spend. They want to be compliant with minimal overhead and obviously recover very, very quickly from outages. So let's keep these, uh, you know, let's keep the environment in mind, 100 apps, 100 GB, 100 captures a day and the organization goals. And now we'll start constructing, uh, you know, how Acme is basically, you know, working on a Kubernetes platform and what are the painful uh, points that they're looking to solve. So we'll describe the uh, you know, organizational structure as to how Acme is using everything today in within Kubernetes. So to begin with, we are going to define Lisa, who's a developer. She's writing code, building uh, you know building the end-to-end -end workflows, uh, and in order to do her job well, she wants to test with production data, so to increase the successful deployments every time they launch into production. Lisa works with Brian. Brian, you can think of Brian as the SRE, who takes the application and runs it within the Kubernetes cluster. And now Brian is obviously fully GitOps uh, oriented and he is uh, you know, also focusing on application uptime, making sure that uh, you know, there is no corruption and in case if there is an outage, he can recover quickly. On the ops side of it, IT ops side, uh, we have Rob, who's also using GitOps to instantiate clusters and manage uh, you know, the environments for the uh, front-end developers. And Rob's main goal is making sure, again, you know, there are no outages at the cluster level. Uh, you know, if there is any migration, DR kind of uh, uh, services required, he wants to provide those. And then Rob works with Jane. You can think of Jane as the higher level IT director who's also uh, focused on business continuity, costs, reducing spend, and so on. Okay, so that defines our Acme Corp organization. Now let's go through the uh, data management capabilities, use case by use case, right? So test data management is one of the use cases that uh, Acme wants to be good at. Application migration to reduce cloud spend, maybe you know, uh, bringing some applications on-prem instead of running it in the public cloud. Compliance and governance, they're using a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, so they need to have a uh, lot of uh, testing in place to understand the impact of whatever they're doing. And then finally, uh, infrastructure availability and ransomware protection. You know, How do they recover from outages and what are the benefits of using a cloud native solution to do so. So to begin with, the first uh, question that Acme is going to be posed with is, what kind of solution do we use? You know, we are in Kubernetes now and we are bringing all our data in. Uh, should we leverage, you know, one of our existing legacy data protection technologies? Now, within Kubernetes, the architecture of an application has changed a lot, right? It's no longer just focused on the data volume. You need to capture the metadata as well. And that kind of defines your application. So right from the get-go, the traditional uh, solutions that they have are not going to suffice the uh, Kubernetes architecture that they are living in. Then uh, Acme thinks, hey, maybe we can you know, adopt a project you know, who is helping in data management and data protection. However, uh, you know, the IT manager, Jane, says that, hey, we need to be thinking about support. We need to be thinking about, you know, are we kind of going to get into some unpredictable behavior which we don't know about, right? So those kind of questions uh, force, are a forcing function to uh, lead the organization into choosing a cloud-native solution, which is an enterprise uh, product with, you know, uh, enterprise-grade support, um, you know, providing higher level features, deeper level features, um, you know, uh, doing everything in a multi-tenant, zero trust uh, manner. So let's talk about test data management and why that is important, 
right? Uh, the cost of failures in software have increased from 1.1 trillion in 2016 to 2 trillion in 2020. And the chart on the right shows you how expensive it is to uh, retroactively fix and or catch and fix issues later down the uh, deployment and the delivery process. Right? So you want to be testing with production data very quickly, very early on, so that you can increase your chances of deploying into production and you know, uh, increase revenue by uh, having excellent uh, customer experience. Now, the space of test data management is also growing very fast. Right? There is a, it's growing at a rate of 12.7% uh, here. And that's happening because there are multiple moving paths in a uh, organization when, with respect to uh, application development. Right? There are multiple pieces you touch and as a result of which, the chances of failure keep increasing. Now, Kubernetes, the philosophy is to deliver software quickly and efficiently. And uh, you, know, you need to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward in making that happen. You, know, you adopt Kubernetes, but you're still failing with your software releases. It's not going to provide you the benefits of Kubernetes in the first place. So from a solution capability standpoint, you, know, you want to have a solution that is fully driven via APIs and policies. Uh, you want to have granular control over data and object capture. And you want to make sure that the solution is storage agnostic, distribution agnostic, cloud agnostic. Because you may have your production environment running in one place, but your test and dev environments may be running somewhere else. So you want to make sure that you know, whatever you need to bring and port the applications from one uh, one cluster to another as possible. Now, let's look at it from some cons perspective, right? Let's say Acme invests into test data management uh, you know, by leveraging a cloud native data management solution. If they invest, they can uh, expect, again, these are variable numbers, you can plug in uh, you know, something else as well, but just putting it into perspective, if they have a 15% impact in revenue, that will change their revenue from 500 million to 575 a year. And if they don't do it, right, complexity of environments is always going to keep growing. You know, your infrastructure is going to keep expanding. Your new revenue will go down because you're not going to be able to service customers. You're going to lose your customers you know, because the competition may be doing it. So net-net, it's a, almost a 35% net impact of 200 million on Acme looking at the direct cost and as well as the opportunity cost. Right? So it def definitely makes sense to invest into test data management to make sure that your software releases are more successful. Let's talk about application migration. Right? Acme is doing multi-cloud. Data shows that 92% of users have a multi-cloud strategy. 82% have hybrid. And uh, from this report from Flexera, what IT leaders have been saying is that their cloud spend has been going up exponentially, significantly, and there is nothing they can do about it. It is, it is a function that they need to adhere to because you know, they cannot stop doing business. So everyone uh, or the IT leaders are looking to uh, control this spend as well as you know, have proper portability of applications. So what are the solution capabilities that you need to look for? Again, it needs to be infrastructure agnostic you know, and policy driven. When you're going to be migrating your applications, you do not want to be doing it you know, uh, on a cherry pick basis. You want to have a policy which says that, hey, these apps can be migrated uh, you know, from cloud to on-prem, on-prem to cloud rapidly and do it under these controls. Data volumes need to be managed as first class citizens, right? so that you have granular control over them and you can move it around easily. More importantly, you need to be able to have a solution that can incrementally patch the data object as, uh, you know, and stage it in another environment. The reason for doing this is when you're migrating, you know, the application piece or the metadata piece is fine, but data has gravity, right? And how are you going to move the data around quickly from one environment to another environment? So that data staging capability needs to be there, right? So that on a click of a button, in a matter of seconds or minutes, you're able to actually move your applications and actually realize the power of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments. So definitely look for those features in the solutions that you are opting in for. 
Now let's let's kind of look at it from a analysis perspective. Let's say Acme decides or figures out there are 50 apps that we can you know port back and forth between public cloud and private cloud and um, you know save some money. Obviously, if they think 50 apps is what they can do, the true savings would be somewhere less, right? Because you're going to have some costs on prem as well of your uh, you know hardware or you know having some personnel manage it more delicately. So the true savings we can assume are a little less in terms of 30 apps. And let's say the cost before on-demand migration was 15K. Now with the savings, you know, not using as much compute and storage, you may probably save some money there. And let's say we end up saving about, you know, four and a half uh, thousand dollars uh, on a periodic basis. So that translates to a 30% savings right away. Right? So think about making your application mobile from one environment to another environment using the cloud when you need it, on demand, burst workloads. If not, you bring it on-prem, you know, run it in a much more controlled cost uh, environment. Let's talk about compliance and governance. Right? Now, if you remember the operations team, uh, Brian is doing GitOps. And uh, you know, with GitOps, he has all his code stored within Git. And he's like, hey, you know, from a compliance governance perspective, if I need to go back and see what was happening at any given point in time, I have that. However, within Kubernetes, there is a difference between the running state versus the desired state. Right? There are a lot of uh, non-deterministic items that get created within a Kubernetes cluster that also need to be captured from a compliance point of view. You know, there are a lot of industry requirements that say, hey, we need the running state or we need you know, the data that you've captured for a very, very long time. If you uh, look at the regulations around AI and ML-based systems, there are a lot of uh, new bills that are being passed by, you know, the American government and EU as well, uh, which say that, you know, you need to do periodic testing of any decision-based testing or any decision-based system to understand the impact of it. And as part of this, it needs to be continuously validated. You know, you, you have audit checks. So all these items or whatever you're doing within your organization needs to be continuously tested and validated. The graphic on the right shows the cost of compliance. You know, it's showing over six years from 2011 to 2017, how the compliance of, or how being out of compliance has cost organizations. And you know, from 2017 up till now, you can just expect this to be exponentially higher. Again, from a solution standpoint, what do you need? Policy driven, right? You cannot make, you know, you know, again, you cannot manually control the compliance and governance of every application. You need it to be policy driven. You need tiered data archiving, right? If you're going to be saving data for five to seven years, then that data needs to be curated and, you know, strategically moved into lower cost storage options. Uh, and that needs to happen on a policy basis to save money. And then obviously you need to have a tool that can do you know, isolation forensic testing of the application for whatever audit requirements are there. Now let's look at it from a, you know uh, analysis perspective again. We said Acme has 100 apps. Let's say there are 60 apps that require long-term retention. And from a backup frequency perspective, they're doing a daily backup. So 365,000, oh sorry, uh, 36,500 backups is what they're going to be doing in a year. 21,900 is what they're going to need for long-term retention. Now, if they have a policy-driven solution that <clears throat> moves the data from S3 to Glacier, you know, and it could be Azure disk, lower storage, whatever it may be, they can save a lot of money and the total cost is just 51K. But if they do not have data staging, that's 500K. You know, this is direct simple math of just calculating how much data you have in S3 and how much you're storing over there. And if you try to do it manually, it's, as I said, it's not even worth doing it because if you, the amount of time a person tries to do this manually, you might justify the cost of a data management solution anyways. So overall, 90% savings you know, from a compliance governance standpoint. Next, let's talk about infrastructure availability. Okay. Global executives report that the failures of infrastructure have 
been increasing or at least stay the same. It's not going away. You know, there are tech issues daily. Human error is the biggest cause of it. And, you know, even if you do not have human error, there is known as, there's something known as silent data corruption. You know, your data can just get corrupted without you even realizing it in real time. Right? So all these issues definitely, uh, you know, beg the reason or the need for a proper solution that can help you recover quickly. Now, let's look at the table that we have over here. You know, the cost of downtime for all these uh, uh, big corporations is huge. The lost revenue, if you look at the last uh, column, is 99 million for Amazon for 63 minutes of downtime. You know, Facebook, recently everyone knows, with their upgrade process, uh, had a big outage, right? Every minute costs money. Same thing with other organizations, whether, with, with whichever industry vertical you may be in. What stats and data show is that every large organization, if they are, have an outage, the average cost they pay is $11,600 a minute. For a small organization, that's about $8,000 an hour. The data also says that 40 to 60% of businesses will never reopen after a data loss. So again, what you need when you are looking for a solution that can help recover your infrastructure, you need DR planning capabilities, right? When you have an outage, you do not want to be struggling and figuring out, hey, how do I recover my minimal viable business then? You want to have it curated, planned, tested uh, regularly. Again, you want to recover quickly. Time is money, right? So data staging is applicable here as well. You need mutation capability. You know, you want to make sure that the application that you have captured can be mutated, tweaked to run in any other environment after a disaster. And again, you need, ha need to have granular control over everything. Okay. Now let's look at it from an analysis point of view. Let's say Acme has 25% of their business go down, right? And let's look at it from two, two angles, right? If they have DR planning and DR staging, and if they do not, from a recovery time perspective, it's 390 minutes versus 96 minutes. Okay. And from a cost translation, if you take the 500 million revenue and just you know, come down to a per minute cost, that is equal to 93K versus 27K. Right. Now, keep this in mind, the cost of, if 50% of the business was unavailable, the cost for Acme would have been 342K. You know, so the exponential, there is an exponential factor there as in when your business, uh, you know, more, more parts of your business are down. So definitely makes sense to have a solution that can help with you know, DR planning and DR data staging. So let's keep this 342K number in mind for 50% outage of the business because we'll use that for the last piece of the conversation. Let's talk about ransomware. Right? Any, any business vertical that we look at is being attacked by ransomware today. 300 million cases of attacks each year. And you don't even know if the attackers are going to give your money back. The cost of an attack has increased to an average of 300K. And the pandemic has uh, you know, given a rise to more of these attacks because of a you know, lot many more mobile devices, different uh, technologies that are being used to access the same data that was being accessed just through a corporate environment before. So when you are adopting a solution here, you want to make sure that it's not just a simple, you know, data backup, data recovery solution, but you want to make sure that the solution is aligned with a proper cybersecurity framework. So, you know, you want to make sure that a solution can identify your assets before they are attacked so that you know what to protect. You are able to detect when an attack happens and obviously when the attack has happened, you're able to recover from it. There are multiple features, you know, from an immutability standpoint, malware scanning standpoint, you know, we spoke about DR planning, DR workflows. There are multiple features that you require from a solution that can make this happen, right? So definitely look out, look out for these kind of features in the solution that you adopt. Let's take a look at uh, ransomware protection analysis, right? We spoke about 50% of the business being out. Let's say uh, Acme Corporation did not have any uh, 
protection against ransomware. Ransom demanded was 300K. Their total cost is 300K plus 50% of the business being out, which was 342 we discussed earlier. That's about 642 or 650K roughly. But now if they had early detection savings, let's say instead of 50% of the business being out, only 25% was compromised. The ransom demanded was the same. You did have DR planning and staging capabilities. You had immutable backups, encryption available. So obviously you do not pay any ransom. The only money or the only cost to you is the cost to recover. Right? So that would be roughly 27K from an outage perspective that we had discussed in the previous analysis as well. So total savings, you know, looking at the money you haven't paid from an opportunity cost perspective is about 420K. Right? Again, these are numbers that you can you know, use in within your own organization to justify these benefits. So let's look at the overall summary of what we've discussed here. Test data management, we're getting 35% savings. Application migration, 30% savings. Compliance and governance, you know, archival, tiered archival, 90% savings. Infrastructure availability, ransomware protection, 33 and 95% savings. What does this all mean, right? Let's say you invest 25K in a data management solution, right? We are showing the benefits in 400K, 500K for you know, being very conservative with the outage that we are describing. That can easily, even a single use case can translate to a 20X improvement in, uh, on your return, on return on investment. Right, so this is, this is a definite need uh, and a new way of looking at data management and data protection within Kubernetes. Also, you know, back in the day, you would have multiple solutions that would support test data management. You would have a separate solution for, you know, let's say, security. You would have another solution for you know, backup recovery. So here, in the Kubernetes space, investing in a cloud-native data management, data management solution, you are getting four different use cases as one technology that you opt in for. Okay? And again, savings are going to be exponential. So as you're bringing in your data in, definitely make sure to invest in a proper data management solution. So that's it from me, folks. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have questions, we'll be at booth P17. Uh, you can come and talk to many of our cloud native experts who can help you with uh, you know, any of the questions that you have. And obviously, if you have any other suggestions and points that you'd like to discuss with me, feel free to reach out. My email is prashanto.kochavara at trilio.io, and my Twitter handle is at kochavara. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening.